Last June, cast members of Netflix's Love is Blind, the show where contestants meet on either side of a wall and decide to get married before ever seeing each other, filed a lawsuit against Netflix for alleged mistreatment, including a string of labor law violations. Cast members are alleging that producers on the show plied the cast with excessive alcohol while not supplying them with adequate food, water, or sleep. They claim the extreme exhaustion and overconsumption of alcohol, combined with being completely isolated from the outside world, left contestants hungry for social connections and fundamentally altered their emotions and decision-making. The contestants further allege labor law violations, including treating the contestants as independent contractors so they could pay them less, while also controlling virtually every aspect of their life and work, which is decidedly against labor laws, which require independent contractors to, as the title implies, have a level of independence in the means and manner of their work. They claim Netflix paid cast members $1,000 per week while requiring them at times to work 20-hour days, seven days a week, amounting to payment of about $7 per hour on average, which is far below California's minimum wage. This, combined with the clause in their contract that said if they walked away before shooting was completed, they would have to pay $50,000 in damages, meant that cast members were allegedly coerced, manipulated, underpaid, and ultimately abused during their time on the show. Cast members are seeking unpaid wages, financial compensation for missed breaks, and additional damages for unfair business practices and labor code violations. The lawsuit is attempting to certify as a class action lawsuit, a notoriously difficult process, so time will tell whether the members are victorious or Netflix settles with them to get them out of their hair. Either way, the story told by cast members on Love is Blind echoes a number of other stories told by other cast members of other reality TV shows for about as long as reality TV has been a thing. And yet, despite this, thousands and thousands of people clamber year after year for a chance to appear on reality TV. And millions more of us, myself included, tune in week after week to watch our guilty pleasure show or shows on the edge of our seats to watch real people live their supposedly real lives. Why is this? Why do people vie for a chance to be on these shows? And why do we keep tuning in? Who's really winning and losing in this scenario? Turns out that while reality TV is usually outlandish and treated like a side show you just can't look away from, it actually shows us a lot more about ourselves and the society we live in than I think most people realize or want to admit. This is why we're all obsessed with reality TV. Roll the intro. <laughs> my partner for this video, my favorite meal prep service, Factor. I've been partnering with Factor for months and months because I genuinely love their product. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen meals straight to your doorstep. They have gourmet chefs creating each meal, and I swear you can tell. This isn't your grandma's frozen TV dinner. I am regularly gobsmacked by the quality of the food that Factor delivers. And this latest meal I tried was no different, and honestly, probably my favorite meal I've ever had with them. It was this rosemary garlic pork chop with creamy Brussels sprouts and broccoli. First of all, I love how many veggies are in this meal. It makes me feel confident that I'm getting in all my veggies for the day. But also, and they do this every time, the vegetables are all tender crisp. There are few things that I hate more than a soggy vegetable, my friends. Yuck. I have never had that problem with Factor. Tender crisp, well seasoned, packed with flavor, and perfectly cooked. Tell me another way you can get all that delivered directly to your doorstep and ready to eat in two minutes in the microwave. I'll tell you, you can't. Factor is it, folks. They offer 27 plus weekly meal options, so you'll never get bored. And they have keto, vegan, and vegetarian options to fit your needs. The taste, the convenience, the flexibility, it can't be beat especially because I can't be bothered to cook. Thanks to Factor, I don't have to. But I also get to eat delicious meals at the same time. This is a no-brainer. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code LEGIA50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Thanks, Factor. So in today's media landscape, there are tons of shows that toe the line of what we might consider reality TV. So let's just define our scope here. Reality TV generally is a genre of TV that purportedly documents unscripted real life situations, often starring unfamiliar people as opposed to professional actors, though sometimes the celebrity status of the contestants themselves is a noteworthy factor of the show. The shows tend to have 
filmed real-life scenarios interspersed with confessionals, or short interview segments, where cast members reflect on or provide context for the events on screen. Some of these shows simply document the lives of interesting people, and some of these shows are contest-based, where cast members are slowly eliminated, either by judges, viewership of the show, or the other contestants themselves. The Emmy Awards divide reality TV into two categories, structured and unstructured. Unstructured programs consist of shows that contain story elements driven by the actions of the characters and lack a consistent, structured template. The 2022 Emmy Award-winning show in this category was Love on the Spectrum US on Netflix. Below Deck, Drag Race Untucked, and Selling Sunset were other nominees in this category. Structured programs consist of shows that contain consistent story elements that recur throughout the season. Queer Eye won the Emmy Award in this category in 2022 with Love is Blind and Shark Tank also receiving nominations. What I'm not talking about here when I say reality TV are things like docu-series or documentaries, game shows, or news and talk shows. They may not be scripted, but they don't quite hit the mark of the classic reality TV genre we're talking about here. But when I say classic, I guess that's relative, as the modern reality TV landscape is relatively new. Scholars and viewers argue over when reality TV actually started in the US. Some of the earliest examples of shows that presented people in unscripted situations started in the 1940s. For example, Queen for a Day was a show in which contestants were brought out onto the stage to tell their stories of recent financial and emotional hardship, usually a sick child, the death of a husband, or the loss of a house, and the winner was chosen by the audience using an applause meter. The worse the contestant's situation, the more likely they were to win. Their winnings would include the help requested, like a hearing aid for their child or a new washing machine, plus other gifts and prizes, which would be announced to them while the song Pop and Circumstance played, and the winner was draped in a velvet robe and given a crown and a throne to sit on. In 1948, the show Candid Camera debuted, showing hidden camera footage of people reacting to pranks. The 40s also saw the emergence of talent search shows, such as Ted Mack's Original Amateur Hour. The first Eurovision Song Contest debuted in 1956. In 1966, the film Chelsea Girls debuted, which was just a series of footage of mostly unknown people filmed by Andy Warhol with no direction. And in 1973, PBS aired An American Family, widely considered the first example of reality TV in the U.S. akin to the kind we know today. Millions of viewers tuned in to watch seven months in the daily lives of an upper-middle-class California family that was falling apart at the seams. The eldest son, Lance, came out as gay, and the parents experienced marital dysfunction that ultimately led to separation and divorce. In 12 episodes, the show revealed a shattered version of the rosy upper-middle-class suburban facade, which spoke to 1970s audiences who were in the midst of a cultural backlash against the perfect 1950s suburbs of their parents' generation. Few similar shows followed An American Family, despite its popularity, because of the technological reality of the 1970s. An American Family was expensive to make, because it was shot on 16mm film. The crews captured over 300 hours of 16mm film over the course of seven months. The film equipment was cumbersome, bulky, and time-consuming to set up, and sound quality was unpredictable. Soon, however, technology caught up with consumer demand, and in the wake of the 1988 Writers Guild of America strike, which halted production of traditional scripted programming, a new type of reality television show was born, one that relied on recently developed lighter, more agile video technology. Cops. Coinciding with the war on drugs and war on crime, cops fulfilled the voyeuristic intrigue, especially of white viewers, for whom the suspects on cops confirmed and reinforced their preconceived ideas of who criminals were and what types of crimes they did. Not long after, in 1992, the real world debuted, pioneering some of the stylistic conventions that are still used in reality TV today, including after-the-fact confessionals serving as narration. By this point, technology had developed so computer editing systems made it easier to quickly edit hours of video footage. The Real World was one of the only reality TV shows in the game for years until 2000 rolled around, and with the new millennium came a new type of reality TV. Survivor. Now on its 44th season, Survivor's huge success with audiences made this type of high-stakes competition reality TV, one that capitalizes on our intrigue when very different people are put into very difficult situations, a staple in reality TV. 
One year later, Fear Factor came along to up the stakes in stunt-based reality TV competitions. I'm Joe Rogan. Welcome to Fear Factor. And by then, the reality TV floodgates were open. The Bachelor premiered in 2002. The Simple Life with Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie came out in 2003. As did Newlyweds with Nick and Jessica, a personal favorite of tween age Lija. Real Housewives premiered out of Orange County in 2006. And The Hills premiered in 2007, as did Keeping Up with the Kardashians. And in 2009, RuPaul's Drag Race and Jersey Shore were both premiered. Drag Race was an interesting development as it was launched during the Great Recession as a budget option. And Lord, you could tell it was budget from those cameras. It was also unlike Survivor and other reality TV shows, not only because it centered queer cast members, but also because, as opposed to the cool $1 million prize for Survivor contestants, Drag Race winners received a photo spread, a role in two ad campaigns, and 20 grand, courtesy of Absolute Vodka and MAC Cosmetics. And therein lies a great example of why reality TV is so popular. We'll get into why as viewers were mesmerized, but I'm talking popular for TV execs. It's the potential for big advertising money with very little production costs. During this boom in reality TV programming, many cable networks, including Bravo, VH1, and MTV, switched to almost exclusively reality TV programming. Especially once the Great Recession hit in 2008, the reason for this was simple money. According to a January 2023 article from Investopedia, a reality show can cost between $100,000 and $500,000 per episode to make. Compare that to the $4 million plus price tag per episode of scripted shows, or the $16 million per episode to make Game of Thrones, for example. This low cost is due to a number of factors, including that sets are mainly just real-life places, camera crews are lean, and reality TV producers often wear many hats, from on-set scripting and interviewing, storyboarding, and post-production editing direction. Plus, contestants on reality TV programs are regular people who are paid weekly stipends like a thousand bucks per week for Love is Blind contestants or a couple thousand dollars per episode appearance, which is much less than the well-known actors on scripted series are paid per episode. In addition to all of this, reality TV is also an excellent gateway for product placement that audiences are more willing to digest than they are in films and scripted series. For example, I noticed in the new Barbie movie that there were a couple shots that lingered a little too long on the car logo, taking me out of the movie momentarily because it's hard not to see how blatant the product placement was. I don't remember which car brand it was, so I guess joke's on them, but I'd be willing to bet that that company paid good money to get three seconds of airtime in the biggest movie of the summer. But not just me, other people noticed and they commented on it. If the same thing were to happen in a reality TV program, the camera pans to the car and lingers on the logo a little too long, I probably wouldn't think twice. Not to mention all the locations that the cast just happens to go to, like random boutiques and cafes where the camera pans on the name of the cafe for a few extra seconds and the workers are all too eager to offer impeccable customer service. This is stuff that in a scripted show or movie would be intolerable to most audiences, but when it's in a reality TV show, we hardly bat an eye. So that means reality TV is both cheap to make and easy to get ad dollars from. And we eat it all up, hook, line, and sinker. Plus, once a network has developed a popular show, they can easily sell the underlying format of the show overseas, sometimes for millions of dollars. That's why versions of American Idol and RuPaul's Drag Race are all over the world. And these huge profit margins that companies like Discovery are making on reality TV often come at the expense of both the producers and the cast members. A Writers Guild of America study of working conditions for nonfiction writers and producers from 2013 found that violations of New York wage and hour laws are endemic in the nonfiction fiction television industry. Almost all writer-producers are incorrectly classified as exempt employees. They work long hours but receive no overtime pay or benefits. The same complaints are being made by cast members, including in the recent Love is Blind lawsuit. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to exploitation in reality TV, especially for its cast members. The Love is Blind lawsuit lays out some of the basics in terms of labor law violations, but it runs so much deeper than that in ways that a lawsuit really could never encapsulate. Entire books have been written about this. I'm currently reading True Story, What Reality TV Says About Us by Danielle Lindemann, and I highly recommend it if you want a deeper sociological look at reality TV and us. The numerous lawsuits filed and cease and desist letters sent by past and present reality TV cast members gives us a further glimpse into the seedy underbelly of reality TV exploitation. In a letter sent last month to NBC Universal, owner of Bravo and the Real Housewives Cinematic Universe, attorneys for Real Housewives cast member Bethany Frankel threatened a lawsuit 
claiming that NBC engaged in, among other things, deliberate attempts to manufacture mental instability by plying cast members with alcohol while depriving them of food and sleep, denying mental health treatment to cast members displaying obvious and alarming signs of mental deterioration, exploiting minors for uncompensated and sometimes long-term appearances on NBC reality TV shows, covering up acts of sexual violence, and refusing to allow cast members the freedom to leave their shows, even under dire circumstances. And the effects of reality TV, from the actual experiences on set to the mistreatment that cast members receive by the public after the fact, can have dire consequences. Take for example that in the past decade, 21 U.S. reality TV stars have ended their own lives, including three members of the cast of Love Island in one year. And even if lives aren't lost, lives can certainly be ruined based on what is captured during reality TV filming and how it's later edited and received by the public. For example, Zara Holland was a 20-year-old who appeared on Love Island in 2016. She was shown having sex on the show and was stripped of her Miss Great Britain title as a consequence. After leaving the island, she discovered countless headlines and opinion pieces had been devoted to criticizing her behavior. The man who also participated in the sex scene from the show, Alex Bowen, has received, um, yeah, zero professional consequences as a result of his behavior. Similarly, Sarah Goodhart, a 24-year-old beautician, agreed to be on Geordie Shore. When her reality TV career didn't take off, she had to find other work, which proved difficult now that the stigma of reality TV star had attached itself to her, but without any of the money or fame that goes with it for a few select cast members. Teresa Giudice has said that the fame that came with the Real Housewives of New Jersey ruined her family. Jessica Simpson has admitted to having panic attacks when seeing reruns of newlyweds pop up on TV. Ozzy Osbourne regrets agreeing to his family's reality TV show. And on and on and on. For every person who's gained fame from being on reality TV, there are probably 10 others who regret ever agreeing to appear on the show. And the exploitation notorious in reality TV makes sense. People who fit in with quote-unquote normal societal standards don't make great TV. Producers have to seek out people who have quirky, strange, and often unstable personalities because it makes good TV. It's what we want to watch. But while it can be easy to argue, well, these people signed up for this and were probably already predisposed to be a bit unhinged, I think that that oversimplifies the exploitation that's happening here. An article from USC's International Journal of Communication states the reality show emerges as part of an exploitative system where underpaid non-professional actors, their persona, reputations, and experiences are commodified. It deems humans as mere means to an end, in this case, commercial success in a competitive media environment. The article goes on to identify common, unethical treatment of reality show participants, including intrusion into cast members' intimate circles and disclosure of personal information, humiliation due to the degradation and ridicule that cast members receive on and off set, misrepresentation in the way their stories are later edited and retold by the shows, appropriation of the person's name and likeness for commercial gain, which they of course agree to, but there's no way a participant can actually know how their name or likeness will appear or be used until the show is filmed and the editing is complete. Negative typecasting, especially the kind that plays into cultural stereotypes, one-sided contracts, also known as contracts of adhesion, wherein the cast member has zero bargaining power because it's a take it or leave it situation. Either you agree to our terms or you don't get to do the show. And deprivation that destabilizes the normalcy of people's everyday lives and manipulates social behavior through the setup of the show itself or through things like excessive access to alcohol with limited access to food and water. And this is all during the actual filming. Once the stories are out in the world being consumed by the masses, a new layer of exploitation occurs as villain edits ruin people's lives and public scrutiny can lead to very real consequences from death to unemployment and so much more. As the article goes on to note, reality TV has been described as a spectacle of shame, which increasingly stretches boundaries of shame, thriving on the shamelessness of what is somewhat derogatorily described as willing victims who knowingly take shame upon themselves. But the disparate outcomes for cast members, especially marginalized cast members like women, queer folks, immigrants, and people of color who experience outsized consequences in their lives after appearing on reality TV, complicate the idea that cast members really are willing victims. As I've already stated, a person can't know the full extent of the consequences of their appearance on reality TV until after filming has concluded and the editing is done. No one goes into a TV show expecting to get the villain edit. 
it, usually. And it can be really easy to fall into the trap of thinking that a stint on reality TV will lead to wealth, fame, and success, when the reality is usually the opposite. But who are the people who agree to go on these shows? After decades of revelations of the abuses of reality TV exploitation, why do people still clamor to get on these shows? A recent season of Love Island, the show that has ruined lives and has had three cast members end their own lives, received over 60,000 applicants in 24 hours. Certainly there are some people who sign up for reality TV shows who understand the assignment. One contestant on The Bachelor summed it up well when she said, if you're just there for love, that's crazy, because what are your odds of this one person being the one? But if you think, you know, this is a once in a life time experience, it's going to open so many doors, and I'm going to make so many new friends. In my experience, you can't possibly think that you're going to go on solely for love, but you have to be open to it. Some people wholeheartedly go on reality TV shows for the prize or the outcome, the money, the love. Many are motivated by other factors, exposure, access to a once in a lifetime experience, to validate their skills or toughness, to promote themselves and their businesses. The level of desperation or coercion depends on the situation, but certainly is a factor. A wealthy white male real estate agent who decides to go on Love is Blind is probably under less duress than a low-income black woman who agrees to appear on The Flavor of Love, for example, or a person who has a debilitating addiction and agrees to go on My Strange Addiction to help pay the bills. And when we exist in a country where 38 million people live below the poverty line and over a quarter of all people live at twice the poverty level or below, which is $55,000 for a family of four, you can't deny that money and a chance at escaping poverty plays into people's motivations to audition for reality TV. And that level of desperation can lead you to do all sorts of things that you wouldn't normally agree to. And these are things that are very difficult, if not impossible, to prove in court after the fact. Duress in signing a contract has to be pretty obvious and direct. Saying, I'm poor and desperate to get out of poverty, while valid and true, probably won't win in front of a judge. And there is, of course, also the cultural obsession with achieving 15 minutes of fame no matter what it takes, made all the more enticing by the reality TV show hosts and contestants contestants who have become millionaires because of their time in reality TV. From Joe Rogan, to Lauren Conrad, to the Kardashians, to Harry Styles. The tantalizing possibility of global fame that can come from a stint on reality TV can lead many to agree to things they later regret, putting them in an easily exploitable position. The reasons why people agree to go on reality TV are complicated and can't be summed up to, well, they were asking for it. And the reasons why we can't stop watching what turns out to be an incredibly exploitative form of entertainment entertainment are equally hard to put your finger on. To be clear, I am a consumer of reality TV. My gateway into the genre was Newlyweds with Nick Lachey and Jessica Simpson, and later The Ashley Simpson Show, because she was a cool teen who wore a lot of black, and I wanted to be a cool teen who wore a lot of black. And then the pandemic brought me to my latest love, 90 Day Fiancé. Not usually the original series where the person brings a foreigner to the United States to get married. That one feels too overtly exploitative, especially when it's a 50-year-old man who brought his 20-year-old impoverished girlfriend to the United States and pretends like there's not just so many layers of creepy power imbalance. No, no. I love the spin-offs of the series, like 90 Day the Other Way, where stupid Americans go abroad to meet the love of their life who they met online four months ago, and chaos ensues when they realize that there are other cultures in the world besides American. And I recognize the sometimes exploitative nature of the show, but I also find it incredibly fascinating from a sociological and psychological perspective. I love to take the role of armchair psychologist and figure out what trauma from these people's past have caused them to act the way that they do in their relationships. It's fascinating to get to be a fly on the wall of other people's relationships, especially when they're also trying to navigate cultural differences at the same time. But I often wonder, why am I like this? A study out of the University of Kentucky identified 16 human joys that can be experienced either directly or vicariously, concluding that television viewing is a convenient, minimal effort means of vicariously experiencing the 16 joys repeatedly. These joys each come with a corresponding motivation behind why we seek out these joys. For example, efficacy is motivated by power and a desire to influence. Freedom is motivated by independence and a desire for autonomy. Self-importance is motivated by status and a desire for prestige. 
loyalty is motivated by honor, etc. They studied reality TV viewers to find the motivations behind their viewing, and they found that status is the main motivational force that drives people to watch reality television. People who are motivated by status have an above average need to feel self-important. According to the study, reality TV gratifies this need in two ways. One possibility is that viewers feel they are more important than the ordinary people portrayed on reality television shows. Further, the message of reality television, that millions of people are interested in watching real-life experiences of ordinary people, implies that ordinary people are important. Ordinary people can watch the shows, see people like themselves, and fantasize that they could gain celebrity status by being on television. But I found this explanation to be lacking. Danielle Lindemann, in her book True Story, What Reality TV Says About Us, points to the fact that reality TV, while often outlandish, also is simply a caricature of us. Us, you and me, but also us as a society. It's a hyper-real depiction of the things that divide us, or the realities of love and relationships, etc. We see ourselves in the cast members, if only a more outlandish version of us. When I watch shows like 90 Day Fiancé, or Love is Blind, or The Ultimatum, I see whiffs of 20-year-old Lija, zero therapy, filled to the brim with daddy issues, just out there raw dog and reality and trying to find love and getting very, very hurt along the way. But as entertaining as these shows can be, as a consumer of them, you have to recognize the damage that they can do. As a recent Time article put it, shows are still edited to reinforce stereotypes, from the vapid blonde to the angry black person to the sassy gay man. Docu-soaps like Selling Sunset thrive on the notion that women are vain, petty gossips. Conspicuous consumption is celebrated and obscene wealth is portrayed as an end in itself. While practically every heterosexual dating show traffics in gender essentialism, reality romances featuring LGBTQ casts remain few and far between. People with disabilities are treated like freak show fodder. Asian and Latinx Americans remain underrepresented. Recent attempts to compensate for this erasure, like Indian matchmaking, have arguably hurt as much as they've helped. Indeed, reality TV isn't just a thing we passively consume, it's something that has profoundly shaped who we are. Reality shows have been found to exacerbate body anxiety, increase physical aggression, and mess with our expectations for romantic relationships. Media critic Jennifer Posner says that reality TV has the power to influence our notions of normalcy versus difference, convince us that certain behaviors are innate for different groups of people, and present culturally constructed norms of gender, race, class, and sexuality as natural. In doing research for this video, I reached into the recesses of my memory for my very earliest experiences with reality TV. I never watched, but I remember extensive advertisements on VH1 for Flavor of Love with Flava Flav and Rock of Love with Brett Michaels, lead singer of Poison. In both shows, the musicians had a group of women compete for their love. The juxtaposition of these two shows is telling about how this programming is positioned and what that says about us. Reality shows with all white casts, plus a few token people of color, are for everyone, while reality shows with mostly black cast members are either marketed to black people as for black people, or are marketed like a freak show that reinforces some of our worst societal stereotypes. In Flavor of Love, the cast members who were mostly women of color were mainly shown to fight, spit, scream, drink, fuck, and be overall hypersexualized, aggressive, and out of control. On Rock of Love, the focus was on the mostly white women competing in actual challenges for Brett Michaels. Their behavior was still outlandish, but it was given a sort of humanity that Flavor of Love cast members weren't afforded, including highlighting genuine love connections the different women were experiencing with Brett Michaels. Whether or not any of this was genuine is of course another conversation, but the way these two similar shows were positioned is telling, and plays into so many layers of racial stereotyping. As Danielle Lindemann concludes in her book, Reality TV has the power not only to show us who we are, but for all of its extreme personalities and outlandish premises, reality TV reflects how regressive we truly are. So what does this all mean for us as consumers and for the future of reality TV? Given the astronomical success of major reality TV programs, including The Bachelor and Survivor, plus the vital role reality TV plays for many major television companies like MTV and Discovery, there's no way that this genre is going away anytime soon. As the lawsuit filed by Love is Blind cast members points out, labor laws could be used to help equalize the power imbalance between big TV companies and cast members and producers. The distinction between employees
employee and independent contractor is important here. Independent contractors have to pay their own taxes, receive no benefits or overtime pay, and cannot unionize and engage in collective bargaining. The trade-off for this typically is that an independent contractor also has the ultimate say over how they do their work. For example, I'm an independent contractor. I make whatever videos I want, and YouTube pays me ad revenue. A freelance graphic designer is an independent contractor for their clients. The clients ask them for an end product, but the freelancer ultimately gets to decide how they go about creating that end product. They call the shots. This starts to get blurry where reality TV casts are concerned. They're not calling the shots for the filming schedule. They're not calling in the shots for how much they're charging or getting paid, especially in shows with more controlled contest-like situations. Contestants aren't controlling where they go or when they go there. Because of this, many people argue that reality TV cast members should be considered employees. This would then bring in all of labor law on their side, including minimum wage, hour restrictions, overtime requirements, benefits, and the power to unionize. In June, the National Labor Relations Board, the one that's in charge of enforcing labor laws, made a new ruling which could mean a change for gig workers and even potentially independent contractors like reality TV cast members. The NLRB sided with hair and makeup stylists for the Atlanta Opera, who were independent contractors seeking to unionize. The board ruled that they are employees with union rights. This overruled a Trump-era standard that limited the rights of independent contractors. And this broader approach will look at the extent of employer control over working conditions, which could set up gig workers like rideshare drivers and even maybe reality TV cast members to be able to unionize and receive the rights of employees. With the current SAG-AFTRA and WGA strikes halting production throughout Hollywood, TV networks and streaming platforms will be relying on reality TV more than ever to make the bottom line. This has led some reality TV stars, including Bethany Frankel of Real Housewives of New York, to call on reality TV cast members to also strike to demand better working conditions. Time will tell if they're able to organize and make that a reality. What do you think? Am I an awful person for watching reality TV? Do you have a show you can't get enough of? Why are you for or against the continuation of reality TV programming? Sound off in the comments. And if you like this video, you might also like my video on the Barbie movie and why conservatives hate feminism. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, including newest patrons, and an extra special shout out to my multi-platinum patron, Brett Piontek. If you're interested in behind the scenes content, access to my research and show notes, content about my dog and all sorts of other stuff, consider joining me over on Patreon today. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.